Thank you, everybody. It's good to be with you. You may be seated. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Eric, for that uh, introduction. I'll text you, tell you how good it was in just a little bit. A lot of good things going on in the church. I was really impressed by all the uh, things happening this fall. The baptism in South Haven is going to be awesome. The men's event is going to be cool. And uh, I noticed the videos uh, on small groups, which is starting again this fall. That's, that's cool. I was reminded I have some strong opinions about pizza. Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to barbecue chicken, good by itself, good on sandwiches, never good on pizza. I, I know that's controversial. And uh, from the video, ranch dressing never makes pizza salad, just so you know. It never turns the pizza into salad to put ranch dressing on it. It's, it's wrong on many levels, many, many levels. So anyway, it's good to be with you. It's always a joy for us. Beth and I watch every service, I mean, almost every service um, online when we're out of town, and so we enjoy just seeing what God's been doing the last couple of years, we're super satisfied, super um, encouraged by it all. And it's just fun to see, you know, how you, you do things in life. You, you set a plan, you fulfill it and all that stuff. You celebrate it and isn't it fun to accomplish things, but there's a certain reward to that. But it's been super rewarding for us over the last couple of years just to see what God's doing through all of you when we're not leading it. And there's just something satisfying. People ask us, how do you feel about everything? It's like, We've never felt better. It is so fun to see you growing in your faith in God, seeing these guys grow in leadership and the team and just the synergy. Give the Lord some praise for all of that. It's just really super cool. So we love it. Last week, uh, Beth and I were in uh, Illinois, uh, Western Illinois. Uh, Beth did a women's conference Friday and Saturday, which was amazing. And then Sunday, they asked me to share a Sunday morning message. And so it's funny, I, I was coming up to take the platform and they said, do you want a chair? Not a chair. <laughs> Did you ask Beth if she wanted a chair? And my God, how old am I? I mean, come on. I mean, do you need a chair? It's like, no, no, I don't need a chair. So anyway, it's, it's good to be appreciated and without chair. So uh, I will. Uh, I'll see. I want to talk to you today a little bit about how to live the way God wants you to live. You know, it's reminded this week. In fact, if anybody has any money in the stock market, you saw this past couple weeks, you know, the market went up, and over the last several months, it's gone up, 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 and then it, it's last couple weeks, it went down, 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 and then it went up, up, up again, and chances are it'll go down, down, down again. And so it's easy to live the way this world lives, where you're just sort of rocking your life based on inflation, based on cost of things. And it's a it's a, it's a rocky life to follow the way the world does, but you know God's got a better plan for that, for your life. It's a plan to just live where you just, you're just at peace, you're confident in God, and just growing each year in your faith, in your life, and just not affected by the ups and downs of the world. And there it really is a way to live that way. It reminds me of the story I heard. This young guy was a real ambitious young man, and he thought, I need to find like the most successful guy in my life. I want to find out what his secret is of successes, and so he tracked this guy down that he knew and, and asked for an appointment and at his office, and he, he met with him, and he came with a pad of paper and the whole thing. He said, I wanna just learn the secret to your success. The guy said, well, sit down, let me, let me walk you through the process. He said, let me go back a few years. He said it was the mid-1990s. Remember back when Air Jordans, I think Air Jordans are still kind of a cool shoe, but back then they were, they were introduced in the late 80s, so he was in mid-1990s, and he said, I bought a, Air, a pair of Air Jordans, for $50, they were a used pair, but I cleaned them up and I spent some time really polishing up, cleaning them up, cleaning all the white and, and I put new laces in them and I put them out for sale. He said it wasn't too long after that, I, I sold those Air Jordans for 200 bucks. And so I took that money and I bought four pairs of Air Jordans. Did the very same thing, cleaned them all up and, and made them just spit shine and then put new laces in them and they were, looked brand new. And I sold those for $800. He said, the next several weeks, I began to do the same thing. He said, you know, by the end of about three months, I, I turned my investment of $50 into $12,000. So the kid was just writing these notes down furiously. And the guy said, and then my wife's grandfather died and left us $200 million. <laughs> How many would appreciate a good grandpa story? So anyway, I want to <laughs> talk to you this morning about how to live and really choosing to live in God's economy. So we're going to look at three passages of scriptures to sort of begin. Here's where they are. Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and Matthew chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now here, listen, before I read it, I want you to know this. 
This is how God sees you. This is how God sees us. And when you hear these words, I know for some of us it's going to be kind of like, wow, is that really true? If God said it, our job is to believe it. Our, our job is to take it as God's word to us. You know, the Bible is God speaking to us. And so when we hear these, don't just think this, well, this is for somebody else. No, this is for you. This is for us. This is what God wants to speak over your life. So you're ready? Let's, let's look at this. Here it is in Deuteronomy 7, verse 12. Then it shall come to pass. In other words, this is going to happen. Why? Because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them. That the Lord your God will keep you with the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil. The increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flock, and the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. Now listen to this. You shall be blessed above all peoples. You shall be blessed above all peoples. What God's saying here is, listen, if, if you follow my word, if you, if you just surrender your life to me, you just follow my plan for your life, you're going to live in such a way that it's going to be different than everybody else on the earth. They're going to look at you and wonder, why is your life so different? And it's not going to be based on us. It's going to be based on him. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 8. That's the first one. The second one, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Two important words here power and covenant. The word power means this. It, it means the ability. Now notice what God didn't say. He didn't say, I'm going to give you wealth. What he said was, I'm going to give you power to get wealth. I'm going to give you the ability to earn a living. I'm going to give you the ability to make money. Now why is that so important? Well, the, the important thing is, is if God just gave us money, just gave you stuff, then chances are you'd make dumb decisions with the money given to you, right? I mean, no, money doesn't bring happiness, but it can buy you a boat. It can buy you a truck to pull it. It can buy a Getty 110 dice down with some silver bullets. Come on, somebody. But it won't make you happiness. It won't bring you that. You'll, you'll do dumb things if God just gave you money. I, I remember for me, I was in, I was in high school, and I, 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 I was in Chess King. Remember that store, Chess King? It's kind of the cool store of our age. I, and right by the lava lamps was a rack of coats. And there was a long leather, or there was a suede jacket, camel suede jacket, came down to about here with a, uh, with a uh, fur collar on it. Oh, baby. I thought, man, I have got to have that jacket. That's the coolest jacket on the planet. I will look so cool in that at whatever I was at the time, six foot four, 120 pounds, <laughs> that that would be it. That would get the chicks for me. I would be a chick magnet wear this thing. So I realized that I was destined for sales because somehow I, I sold that idea on my mother that she should buy me that coat. And she did. And so I had that coat. How many times did I wear it? Once. One time. Now, how many of you have made a dumb decision? You, you get some money, you just buy something dumb. You think, why didn't I waste my money on that? Well, that's why God doesn't just give you money. He gives you the power, the ability to make money. I tell you what, when you've earned money, you pay a lot more attention to how you spend it. That's God's wisdom. Okay, what's the second word? The second word is, cove is covenant. What's a covenant? Well, probably the strongest uh, description of a covenant in our, in our minds today, in our Western culture, would be a marriage, a marriage covenant. In other words, when you get married, what's yours become your spouse's, what's your spouse's become yours. Like for us, Beth and I, when we got married, when we got married, I, I just, as you've heard many times, she instilled this amazingly beautiful, uh, amazingly smart. I, I mean, just an amazing person. And, and every year it gets more amazing. I don't know how she does it. But she didn't, she didn't have anything. All she had was books and tapes when we got married. That's it. Nothing. She had nothing. So all of her books were mine. But I had money. And you know what? All my money went to her. And, and it still does. It still does. 
So, so covenant means what's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. God just said, listen, we're in covenant with each other. So this whole idea of making you something above all peoples of the earth, I want to show myself through you. I want to give you the, the ability to, to gain wealth so that you're going to live life in a different way that's going to attract people to me. That's what this is all about is learning how to do that. So how do we do it? Well, Matthew chapter 8. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, excuse me. I said 8, make it Matthew 6. Verse 24, here's what it says. No one can serve two masters. Now, what's the word master mean? It means one having supreme authority. Not just authority, but supreme authority. In other words, the top, the top one. He said no one can serve two people or two masters, two people with supreme authority. You can't give that away. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the, we would call it the world system, the money system. One, one translation, the Amplified says it this way, money, possessions, fame, status, or whatever is valued more than the Lord. He said you can't serve two masters. You've got to make a choice. So here's what we learn from this. There's no middle ground. Either you, you decide you're going to live and follow after God or follow after the world's way. We would call it this way, God's economy or the world's economy. Which way are we going to live? We, we can decide. How are, how are we going to live our life? One brings great peace and one brings unpeace. One is stable and the other is unstable. He says, you got to make a decision who's going to be your supreme authority because the reality is you are going to serve one of them. Either we're going to serve the Lord or we're going to serve money. And either we learn to learn for money to serve us or we're going to have to learn how to serve it. It'll be Lord over our, our lives. So it's, here's the thing that's important to understand. It's a decision you make regardless of how much money you have. It's simply, simply a way of life. Here's the key. I think this is the key to this, and I want you to hear it real clearly. We didn't invite God into our worlds. He created us to live in his. This is his world. Let me share just two scriptures with you from the Bible. Real, real clear. First is Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's. And the fullness therein, the world and they that dwell therein. In other words, this world, everybody here, we're not here by ourselves. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't create this world. God did. So it's like you, there's a subtleness that comes with that, okay, I am not the God of this world. I am not the God of my world. I'm not Lord of my own life. There is someone greater who has su supreme authority over us if we give it to him. Second verse is this, Psalm 50. For every beast of the field is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Other, other, where, other places in the Bible, it says the silver and gold is his. So the earth is his. Everything that dwells in, in it is his. The cattle on a thousand hills is his. The silver and gold is his. I guess all of it's his. So that what makes us then to live in his world is learning how to be stewards of his things. We don't take possession of anything. And so when we do, we enter into his economy. We don't live the way the world lives. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 6 says it this way, we brought nothing into this world, and we can be certain that we can carry nothing out. In other words, when you and I were born, the, we were born, the doctor slapped us, we took our first breath, and the doctor whispered into our ear, you're broke. Welcome to planet Earth, you're broke. you got nothing. Everything you get is because of somebody else for many, many years, right? We did not bring anything. Don't worry, Mom and Dad, I got this covered. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get lunch today. No, you didn't. You have nothing. And the same thing happens when we die. When we die, we may leave something behind, but we're not taking anything with us. When we get to heaven, we broke. We got nothing. So it's like when you, when you can live that way, there's a bit of freedom to that. Amen. It's like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm good. Then what that means is I'm going to learn to rely on God. So I'm going to share with you really seven simple principles of how to live in God's economy and why you want to rather than living in the, the world's economy. So you ready? Here they are. Here's number one. There's God and the world. Here you go. Number one, 
God's economy, you're character-driven. In the world's economy, you're greed-driven. Character-driven versus greed-driven. Matthew chapter 16, here's what it says. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The world's way of thinking is this. Jesus said to the group, he said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So let's talk about that. In God's economy, which is character-driven, it's all about who you are and who you become, not what you have. It doesn't make any difference what you have. What makes a difference is who you are. You know, you can, you can not have much and be extremely generous. You all track it? You can be extremely generous with your time, extremely generous with your love, extremely generous with the things that you're passionate about in life. But, but again, if you're living in the world's economy, you, you tend to be a little bit, a bit greedy. But who are you becoming? And what will you do to sort of guard your heart, guard your soul? Remember the Bible says, guard your heart, for out of it come the, all the issues of life. I remember one time we were on a cruise. If you've ever been on a cruise ship, they got these giant hall, or excuse me, stairwells that go up and down the ship, and, and, um, and so I'm walking down one of the stairwells one time, and all by myself, and just walking down, and I see on the, on the ground, there's a $100 bill, and at first I think maybe it's a track, you know, a gospel track, you ever seen those, that, it's a $100 bill, you open, turn it over, and it's a thing that says, get saved, you know, yeah. Jesus is worth more than 100 bucks, so, but I look, I grab it, but it's a, it's a $100 bill, so I think, well, praise God, God's good, he's our provider, I'm going to take this money with God's help. I'm going to the casino. I'm going to turn this $100. No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I thought it's not my $100. So what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, $100, and lose his soul? So I thought, well, so I went down to the guest services desk in the, in the ship, and I put the $100 bill in the counter. I said, hey, listen, somebody dropped this in the hallway back there. They are probably looking for it, and I walked away. The guy was like, look at me like I'm an idiot. Well, in the world's eyes, I'm what? An idiot. But I, I, it's not my $100. What's my soul worth? I'll tell you another, <laughs> this, is, this may sound even crazier. So I'm, I'm at a car wash, one of those spray car washes where you spray your own car, you know. And do they still have those where you put the quarter in? Yes. So you, know, you got to bring like a thousand quarters with you to wash your car. <laughs> so I, I go there to wash the car. And there's a stack of quarters on, sto- on top of the machine. Like somebody had come and put a stack of quarters up there but forgot they put them up there. Well, they were there. And so, again, oh, God is good. He, no, no, no. He is good. Those aren't my quarters. What if the person comes back right after they put left their quarters and realized they left them there came running back because that's the last couple of bucks they have. And, and, and I, oh, I, yeah, but I, I use those to wash my car. Well, heck no. So I, I, did, I just put my own quarters, left them there. He said, that sounds stupid. Well, I don't know. My soul's pretty healthy. How you doing? See, when you, when, you won't take, when you won't take quarters on top of the spray machine, you won't, you won't cheat on your taxes. Just, just saying. God, God is good. Number two. In God's economy, you're content. In, in the world's economy, you're discontented. It's, it's so simple. Here's what he said in, in Philippians chapter 4. This, Paul said this. He said, not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased or how to live without, and I know how to abound. Wow, you've learned how, listen, whether things are going great or not so great, I'm steady because I've learned to be content. I've learned to be happy with what we have. On the world side, here's what they're, they're discontented. Listen to this, Ecclesiastes 1. Everything is wearisome beyond description. What a way to live life. Wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. So when you're content, you're happy with what, what you have. When you're discontent, you're unhappy about what you don't have. You're never happy. I remember just years ago, I had some friends. They, uh, they didn't have much, but what they had, they always shared. They had a small, just 
dumpy cottage up on a lake in kind of in Michigan area. And they'd go up there, spend the weekends, and so they invited me to come with them. And I was doing pretty well in my life. I had lots of money, extra money, and I felt, you know, pr- pretty satisfied. But their little cottage was this small little, I, I, don't, I don't mean this with all respect. I love these people, love the family. It was a dump. In fact, the, the, to flush the toilet, you had to pour a bucket of water in it. Do you ever, have you ever had it done to the toilet? It's the only place I've ever done it was at their house. You'd have to, you'd go to the bathroom, you have to take a bucket of water and flush the toilet. And they had, they had a little um, screened-in porch where they had a couple cots. That's where I slept when I visited. And I, and I, but I loved them. And they were so generous and so kind. And I remember the, the matriarch, the mom of the family, she said one time, she said, I wonder what the poor people are doing. <laughs> and I thought to myself, You're poor. <laughs> somebody ought to tell you you're poor like most people don't pour water in the toilet to flush it but you see they learn to be what say it with me content all right number three god's way and the world's way god's way is eternal success the world's way is temporary success See, we all think about these wonderful people that, you know, you all know them, the famous celebrities in the world. But imagine somebody who gains the whole world, but in the end they die and they don't go to heaven. What are all that success really bring them other than temporary satisfaction? But we can have eternal satisfaction. Listen to this verse in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, don't, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys. For where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your, listen to this, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We often misquote that verse. It's often quoted about where your heart is, there's where your treasure is. But notice that's not what it says. It says where your treasure is, there's where your heart is. In other words, you direct your treasures, and when you direct your treasures, you're indirecting, directly directing your heart. Your, your heart follows your treasure. Where your treasure is, your heart is. So when you make an investment into a property, into a stock, into a business, all of a sudden, you love that, right? Why? Because your heart just followed your money. You all with me? That, so th- this is hugely important because, again, it's a way of living your life that's different than the rest of the world. Now, how's the world think? Well, they look for temporary success. In, in Luke chapter 12, there's a great story about a guy who, who, who had tremendous success, in fact, he, he collected so many things that he, he now, he didn't have room for everything in, in his barns. He said, so he said to himself, I'm going to tear down my barns and big, build big, bigger barns. I need more space for all my stuff. And I'm, I'm going to build those barns and fill those up. He says to himself, and listen, he says to himself, then I'll eat, drink, and be merry. Now, actually, in the Bible, it talks about God saying to us, eat, drink, and be merry. But he's not, God's not saying that. He's, this dude's saying it to himself. Why? Because he's built himself on temporary success. Now, did that impress God? Now, listen to what, what God said in Luke chapter 12, verse 20. But God said to him, fool, fool. Now, I, I, when I, you know, if God was ever to speak to us, I'd like him to say something to me like, beloved, son, redeemed, not fool. Prefer to stay away from that one. He says, he says, fool. Then he adds to it, here's why the guy's a fool. He said, this night, your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be that you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So think about that just for a second. Hold that verse over here, and let's add that verse we just read in Matthew 6, 24, that says, lay up treasures in heaven, 
where moth and rust doesn't corrupt. Let's lay that verse with 1 Timothy 6 that says we didn't bring anything into this world and certainly we're not taking anything with us. We may, we may leave this earth broke, but we could have decades of treasure stored up in heaven. As, I, as, I'm, as we're getting closer to, to heaven, I'll tell you what's exciting is to know that I may leave here broke, but I'm walking into some treasures in heaven. 40 years of treasures. 40 years of treasures of, 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 of heaven. Man, that's exciting, isn't it? It's, we're talking about how you live your life, either in the world's economy or in God's economy. Number four. Number four, it, it's in God's economy, what can I give? In the world's economy, it's what can I get? Proverbs eleven twenty four says, there is one who scatters yet increases. There's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Another translation says, give freely and become wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Well, the world's way is this. Listen to this, Proverbs 13. Lazy people want much but get little, but those who work hard will prosper. Isn't that interesting? So you say, where do you start? Well, well, let me read this verse for you, and then I'll tell you a story. So there's a passage in Scripture in in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. It says this in uh, chapter 3, verse 10. It says, bring all your tithe. That just means bring 10% of what comes into your life. He says, bring that to the storehouse. Bring that to the church. That there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. God says, try me in this. So I remember back when I I first got saved. I was, uh, I had a good job and and, uh, at the time and, and, and started going to church and and uh, I would go to church on, on Sunday mornings and, and uh, Sunday nights sometimes. And uh, I, I would bring with me t- something to give. You know, back then they had offering plates. Remember that when they had plates? These were gold plates with like velour, you know, base on them. You ever, ever seen those? Yeah, remember those? It was like this piece of art from heaven, you know, that we're, we're, we're like placing it into a heavenly reservoir. <laughs> so I would, I would come and I'd bring 20 bucks with me. I'm thinking, yeah, 20 bucks. I'm probably one of the biggest givers in the church, 20 bucks. I, 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 I'm telling you the truth. I honestly thought that. I thought when I came in, the ushers were like, oh, I, I want to be in his, his, his row when I pass the plate. I want to be the one to receive this heavenly gift because it's, it's massive. I, I, I kind of thought I heard the angels in heaven singing, you know, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. No, I, I, honestly, I, I thought that. Until, until one day, well, I actually, I, I thought the pastor too, they probably told them about me. I was, kind of, I was probably going to be a guest speaker at the giver's dinner. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I, I'd come in and he'd see me and go, okay, all right. We're going to make it another week because JJ's here. He, he popped his 20 in the, in the, in the bucket. And so then, this is several months later, uh, after being a regular giver, I thought, you know, the pastor had the audacity one Sunday night to preach on tithing. And I didn't, I didn't understand it. I, my parents, I was uh, raised a Methodist, and my parents, they, in the Methodist church, you made annual pledges. I don't know if you ever did that, but they, I remember they had a box of pledge envelopes. And, and they would give each week when they came based on their pledge. I, I don't know how much it was. I, I still don't know how much they ever gave. But they, they gave regularly, so I, I thought I was just doing my, doing my thing. So anyway, he talked on tithing and talked about 10%. And I'm, I'm looking down the room and I'm thinking, you people give 10% of what you, what you make to God? Are you I'm like, God, do you know how much I make? So I'm, at the time, I was, I was making probably 1000 bucks a week. This was back in 1984, 85, something like that. So it's a long time ago, but it was a good amount of money at the time. And I'm thinking, 1000 bucks a week and I'm giving 20? I, I'm giving 2%. I'm not giving 10%. I got I to gotta 10x my giving. I got to times my giving by 10 every week. I'm thinking, that's crazy. But I, the more he talked about it, I said, well, I don't want, I don't want to be the one freeloading. I want to at least do my part. That's all I want. I just do my part. I'm going to do my part. So, so 
at the end of the message, I'll never forget this, at the end of the message, he had us all bow our heads and, you know, that whole thing. And, and you know, if, if this message touched you and you're ready to commit to give God, you know, 10% of, of, of your life, and, and I don't like making decisions that are just emotional. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it the rest of my life. You all with me? I mean, if you're going to decide, just do it. So he said, I want you to, you know, if that's you, lift your hand up high. So I, I closed my eyes. I, I lifted my eyes. Just me and Jesus. There's no one looking around. No one's looking at you. I'm so, yes, Jesus. Ten, you got it, brother. He, he, and then he says, okay, put your hands down. Then he says, okay, if you meant what you did by raising your hand, I want you to stand up. He says, stand up? What? 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 I'm six foot six. When I stand up, the whole room notices I'm standing up. I'm the biggest giver. I thought I was the biggest giver in the church. I got to stand up now. Tell them all I'm a cheater. You know, I'm a cheat. I'm a cheating. <laughs> so I stood, stood up with the, you know with the other people, and he said, "Now, if you're really serious, I want you to come down up. Front. <laughs> I want you to come down up front. Now, we're not doing that today. Just saying, you know, relax. All right, relax. So I." I I, I, I started that walk, that walk of shame, you know, that walk of shame to the front. So I, I meant what I did when I raised my hand, you know, when I stood up and I got to walk the walk of shame. I started at 6'6", six, six. by the time I got to the front, I was 5'2". I was like, oh, <laughs> no, God, I'm a loser, you know, my like, God. But that was 40 years ago, and, I, and I've never gone back on it. It's, it's such a wonderful way. Beth and I have lived that way our whole life, our whole married life, and it's so good because it's such, it so sets you solid. God, if I can control that, if I can do just the littlest thing, then God will help me with everything else. It's amazing how that, how that works. All right, number five, God's economy, the world's economy. In God's economy, it's more than enough. In the world, it's never enough. Second Corinthians 9, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. What's the world's side? Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Isn't that true? So what, is good, what good is wealth? Except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers. Well, none of us want that. Number six. This, I think, is really important. Number six. In God's economy, we love God and love people. And it's the driving force for this economy. It's the, it's the heartbeat of this economy, is loving God and loving people. In the world's economy, it's the love of money. Jesus said to a young man, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love people, pretty soon pretty clear. What about the other one? Love money. For the love of money, not money, but the love of it. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Why? Because of the love of money. Again, we're either going to let money serve us or we're going to serve money. So like I say, loving God and loving people is the heartbeat behind what we do in terms of being generous, about terms of being a giver. Let me share a couple stories with you. Remember, this was, oh, a long time ago, probably 25 years ago. You're sitting right here. Steve and Lois Dyke House were, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell on you a little bit. So we're, we're, we're um, I had this idea that God wanted me to give our, my van away. We had two cars. Beth had a van and I had a van. We had four little kids, and so we were always traveling, going, 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 going with these kids. And, but I really felt the Lord wanted me to give the van away to someone, and I wasn't sure who, who, who to give it to. So I prayed about it and just couldn't get clear. And it was several weeks about really going over, because this is a big decision to give a car away. And I thought, this is, okay, finally I, I figured out what family I thought I should, we should give it to. And um, so I've, I've been praying about it, and I'm pretty sure this is what the Lord wants. And then one end at church, I, I walk by Steve Dykehouse here, and he's talking to the, the father of this family. And, and he's talking to them about selling his car to them because their car broke, broke down and they need a new car. And, and so they're talking. And I walked up to Steve and, and, and this guy, and I said, listen, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ruin your deal because I think I'm supposed to give my car to you. 
So I did. I gave him the keys and the title, and, and, and then I was without a car for three months, <laughs> at least three months. You know, we have a busy life, and I don't have a car anymore because I felt by faith to give it away. And so I, I didn't want to go get another car. I just thought, what, God, what do you want to You didn't tell me what to do next. So I'm thinking someone's going to give me a car. <laughs> so, I mean, every day I, someone would reach in their pocket for the keys. I'm like going, <laughs> come on, baby. God is good, you know. Somebody bring out a Mercedes key. I'm like, oh, you know, you don't have to. That's awfully nice. No, never, not one offer. Three months later, I'm like, God, I, I got to bum a ride with my wife. I'm an adult. I don't have a car. Until finally he said, just go get what you want, and I'll take care of it. And so he did, and I, I got what I wanted and drove that. Fast forward another 10 years, 12, 15 years, whatever it is. Beth is driving a beautiful Lexus, a, a hybrid Lexus, white, beautiful leather interior, just a gorgeous car. It took us, it took, it took us about four years to pay that thing off. I paid it off. We now own it scot-free. And, you know, within hours of that, she says to me, and I didn't even talk to her about just paying it off. She doesn't even know. I mean, I, I mean, it's within hours. She says, I just think God wants us to give my, that car away. I say, he what does what? I just paid for that thing. But she said, no, I, I really do. So she, again, she prayed about a number of people. She came to her heart and her mind. And finally, she, she settled on a pastor's wife here in town. I won't tell you who it is, but just a pastor's wife here in town. And so she, she got a hold of the pastor. And she said, I just feel like God wants me to give your wife a car, and he said, oh my gosh, that would really bless her. She was going through a rough stretch, and that would really just touch her heart in a real special way, so she gave her car away. So over the years, you know, we've given cars away, motorcycles, boat, we've given a lot of stuff away that, that just, why? Because we're just stewards of it. Right. Such a great way to live. In fact, we had an investment one time in property. We had grown the investment over 10 years to, uh, you know, pretty good sum of money, about, about a little over 100 grand. And, and we sold the investment. Now we have the $100,000. What should we do with it? Because we could turn that 100000 into a whole lot more if we, we did something. But we really both felt in our heart we should pour it into ministry. And so we gave that to the church. We were the, we were the largest single gift to the church in its history for, for a while. And because and, it was 100, 100 grand. And until somebody a few years ago, they beat us out. And then somebody else did. And so we're just, we're just down the list. We're not that, you know, we're In fact, we're still probably in the top 10, but we're open to be knocked out. I'm just, just, just saying. Raise your hand, stand up, yeah, come forward. I'm not, no, I'm kidding. So, so anyway, God, 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 God's good. But you give because you love people. I have a friend, I, I'll tell this, one, one more story. I'm running out of time. I want, uh, another story. This friend of ours, who's, he's an extreme giver. Every time we go anywhere, he's always buying coffee, lunch, dinner, breakfast, you name it. He's, I got to fight him to buy it because he's such a, such a, it's a way of life. And I, I, I can't tell all the details, but God has blessed their lives a thousandfold because of what? He's just learned to be a giver. Number six, I got to go quick. No, I'm not, sorry, number seven, number seven. Steady and diligent is God's way. The world's way is get rich quick. Good planning, hard work leads to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. The world's way. A trustworthy person will get a rich reward, but a person who wants riches quickly gets into trouble. Well, there you go. There you go. It, it's slow and steady, diligent, consistent, wins the race. One, one time, this was we, when we had a, a really home, beautiful home in a lake nearby here in, in the area that we had built. And this was after many homes and, again, growing our equity, living within our means, all those things. We, we were able to build this house. It's a beautiful house. And so the guy bringing the water softener, salt into the house one day, young kid, he's got two bags of salt over his shoulders. He walks in our house, and you walked in, you kind of see the, the whole layout of the house, and then you see into the lake. It was just a beautiful setting. And he walked up, and he walked into the house, and he goes, oh, my gosh, how does a guy get a house like this? Just like that. Probably not good training, you know, for customer service. But I thought to myself, well, son, sit down. Let me tell you the principle of tithing. You know, let me tell you about, you know, uh, uh, 
delayed gratification. Let me tell you about years of, of, of living within our means. If I, I made a dollar, I didn't spend a dollar ten. I, I spent, we spent 90 or we spent 80. We didn't ever overspend. We always stayed within our means. We've been givers for almost four decades now. That's, that's how a person gets a house like this. It takes time. And you'll get there and I don't know, maybe sooner than we did it, but it took us 30 years to get here. But it's been worth every minute of it. It's been worth it because now we get to enjoy the, the fruit of our labor. We, God didn't just give it to us. We worked together with him. He gave us the ability, but to his glory, here we are. I, I didn't say any of that. I just said, you know what? It just takes time, son. The conditioner's downstairs. <laughs> That's all. I thought I'd save it for you rather than, than him. All right, we've got to wrap it up. Here's just the final thoughts. God versus the world. Faith-based fear-based. Trust God, trust self. Built on a rock, built on sand. Superior, inferior. Holds loosely, holds tightly. One final scripture, and we'll close with this. Let me just echo the words of David, King David, who said this. He said, I've been young, now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. There's one of two ways we can live our life, in God's economy or in the world's economy. And I'm here to tell you, I can guarantee you, there's a peace that passes all understanding. There's a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. There's a life available to every one of us if we'll live in God's economy rather than this world. And it's worth it. It's worth every penny. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together in your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We owe it all to you. Thank you for helping us live a way that honors you, but yet lives the life the way you planned us for us to live our lives. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now with your heads still bowed, close your eyes just for a minute. Let me speak to your heart. Because if Jesus is not the Lord of your life, then you've been trying to live life on your own. It's not a, I'm not picking on you. It's just the, re the reality. You're living in the world's economy. You're living God's, outside of God's economy. You're living your way. You're the Lord of your own life. But Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth for one purpose, to live a sinless life so he could sacrifice his life for us. The greatest gift that God could give us is priceless. It's the blood of his Son, who on that cross shed his blood for us, took our sins upon himself so we could walk in freedom. The Bible says he became poor that we might become rich. How rich? Well, just rich in life. To enjoy life like you can't imagine apart from God. It's a higher way to live life. It's not a roller coaster. I'm not up one week, down the next week. It's going from faith to faith and glory to glory the way God always intended. And that's the way God wants life to be for you. But it requires a decision. We call it faith. Trusting that God is who he says he is, he'll do what he says he'll do, and his word is true. All you need to do is submit yourself to him. Jesus said, a man must be born again. How is a man born a second time? He's not talking about natural birth, but a spiritual rebirth, a reconnection with God that simply comes from inviting him into your life. Again, this is his world, not yours. But when you can open the door of your heart and say, God, I want Jesus to be my Lord. I want to live in your economy. And if that's you this morning, whether or not you've never said a prayer like this before, I want you to know God will hear you. Maybe it's been a while since you said a prayer like this. Maybe life's been tough on you. Maybe you've sort of walked away from the things of God and experienced some of the hardships that come from that. Well, I'll tell you what, today can be a new day. Today can be a new day for many, many of us that's you, I want you to just lift your hand to have, in fact, lift both hands to have. I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to say this together. Let's all of us say this prayer together. Say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and that you died on a cross for my sins. And I choose today to live in your economy. Lord Jesus, from this day forward, you're going to have supreme authority over my life. I submit to you Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you guys. Thanks so much. Appreciate you.